Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Enkian Honing. He's professor in music cognition at both the Faculty of Humanities and the Faculty of Science at the University of Amsterdam. He is known as a passionate researcher in this new interdisciplinary field that gives us fundamental insights in the cognitive mechanisms underlying musicality. He published several books, including Music Cognition, The Basics, The Evolving Animal Orchestra, In Search of What Makes Us Musical, and an edited volume with a research agenda on musicality entitled The Origins of Musicality. So, Dr. Honing, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, nice. Nice to we're going to have a conversation. Sure. So, I mean, uh, how do you define musicality and how do you distinguish it from music? Yeah, that's that's a good, uh, a good start. Um, because it's, it's an important difference. Uh, the term musicality is a term that we've been starting using to sort of uh, try to avoid some problems that we're probably going to talk about later. Uh, but basically to, to separate between the, between the idea of music and the idea of the capacity for music. And musicality refers to the, uh, to the capacity for music. So it is globally defined as a naturally spontaneously developing set of traits that allow us to perceive, make and enjoy music. So it's a very general definition, but it, but it's, uh, it makes clear that, you're, that we're interested if, you, if you're studying musicality in the, let's say the, the cognitive and biological mechanisms that allow us to perceive and enjoy and make music. And music is then this more, this construct that we see all over the world with lots of similarities and diversity, uh, uh, which is then with all kinds of social and cultural influences, but it is basically constrained by, that's the assumption, by this notion of musicality. So musicality is the capacity and, and, and music is in that sense the phenomenon, the, the, the objects that we see all over the world. Mm -hmm. And that distinction helped my personal thinking a lot because you don't run into trouble in what is music and what is not music? Is, is a bird singing music, yes or no? All these problems are in a way avoided by focusing more on the capacity for music. And the term we use for that is musicality, which is maybe not a proper term because most people think with that term, oh, it's about musical skill. It's about being uh, a talent or a prodigy or, or, or a very well-trained musician is more musical than another musician. But it is really about, it's more, it's more than, than that. It's far more than that. It's actually our everything, something we all have. So we all have, all humans at least, uh, we think have this capacity for music. And that's an interesting thing to realize. So next to the capacity for language, which is studied in, by a large quantity of uh, researchers, we're interested in the capacity for music. And uh, we have work to do. <laughs> we'll probably talk about that. Yes. So from a cognitive perspective, uh, what are the components of musicality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the definition is still very broad. Yeah? It says a set of traits. And there is, yeah, we're, we're sort of, there's a group of researchers interested in this phenomenon, and, and we have different components that we think could be part of it. And there is also a lot of disagreement. <laughs> um, but we agree, I think, and most of us agree uh, on two components that have to do with melody and with rhythm cognition. In a melody domain, it's relative pitch. We think that that is a crucial uh, aspect of musical listening, of, 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 of recognizing a melody independent of its absolute uh, frequencies uh, or of the tempo in which it is played. You recognize it. Oh, it is that thing, that object. That turns out to be a very, yeah, it, it gives us lots of pleasure in listening because we see, we hear these relationships between melodies that we think are the same thing. Um, it's also, but it's difficult to trace back in the animal world. So that makes it a very intriguing uh, and interesting capacity. So that's a relative pitch. And the other one in the rhythm domain is, is beat perception and synchronization. Uh, so so the, also a trivial skill for most of us uh, that you uh, pick up the, the, the tempo of the music that you hear that something slows down or speeds up or 
that you can tap your foot to it, that you can dance to the music, that you can make music together. It's a fundamental mechanism that we need to be able to make music together or perform rituals together. And again, uh, quite a challenge to trace that also back in the animal world. So there is that those are the two components that we think are, yeah, they are trivial to us. And the musicologist thinks, well, that's not worth studying. <laughs> the beat, well, it's very clear, it's in the score. Uh, but if you try to, 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 to model it or to understand it, it turns out to be a very, very, yeah, uh, peculiar thing that's very fundamental, but that they don't understand very well why it is, why it comes so naturally to us humans, why young children have to move if they hear music, why, what, is, what is happening there. So that makes, those are the two components that I would highlight, uh, relative pitch and beat perception. And there are more high-level components that uh, colleagues are proposing uh, in the melody domain, for instance, tonality. So the notion that some tones in a, in a melody are more stable or are more uh, yeah, stable than other ones. Uh, it's, it's still yeah, discussed whether it's a cultural phenomenon or whether it's indeed also uh, biologically uh, embedded or can be explained with biological mechanisms. Uh, and, and the same in the in the in the rhythm domain, you have things like like meter. Uh, some theories say, well, this hierarchy uh, in multiple levels of hierarchies in rhythm is also something that is uh, a predisposition of humans and that we, makes us different from other animals. Also, there is a lot of agreement, disagreement uh, in the literature. And there, at the other end, there's more lower level ones, so lower than the relative bits and big perception that have to do more with isochrony. So, so really recognizing regularity is something a metronome or not. Uh, in the rhythm domain and in the uh, pitch domain, it's it's contour perception. There's so there, there are multiple components that are candidates, uh, but as said, uh, disagreement or or just still too little research done to to decide on whether how essential they are. Uh, but interesting. So, so that slowly we slowly start to map out what these components could be, uh, um, and. Uh, yeah, and comparative biology plays a big role in trying to decide well, what is it really special to humans? Uh, how sure can we be that it is, has a biological basis and not a cultural, mainly a cultural or social reason that it is there? So it's, so it's good to, to decompose these, these contributions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and of course, they both, uh, both cult or culture, social influence, uh, environment in general, and biology, it's always both mechanisms, but it's, I think for, for music, for this particular phenomenon of, of, of a capacity for music, if you assume that that's there, it's, it's good to disentangle these contributions to say like how much biology is involved and how much cultural influence or flexibility is there. Um, and that's a relatively new idea again, because yeah, most ethnomusicologists really think of music as a cultural phenomenon with too much diversity to have any biological basis. So there was uh, it's actually a real reasonable argument. Uh, but, but you see in, in several studies now uh, that have been done that compare musics all over the world that there are indeed enormous differences, but also a lot of similarities that hint again at these two mechanisms, uh, like a regular beat, you find it in almost all musics. And with a subdivision in two or three, and you see it in the pitch domain that there's always discrete pitches most of the time. Small scales with unequal intervals, also hinting that there is apparently some cognitive advantage of, of, of defining the octave in a certain uh, certain way. Okay, so, uh, but we find some of these cognitive components in other animals, correct? Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, there are different reasons for looking at other animals. For me, the first reason was to see like is it it's a it's a way of seeing if it has a biological basis. Then you would expect to share some of these components with other animals, and then they have a common ancestor that might have had that skill as well. And you can even in the here and now they say something about the history of of how uh, this capacity might have evolved. Um, uh, so that's a, a, a common strategy. You also see that in language research. Um, and these two components are then, of course, the, the first candidates to look for. And then beat perception has been, I think, one of really the first thing that has been studied in a systematic way in other animals. Um, and 
Yeah, quite contrary. I mean, Darwin, Charles, I have to mention him, of course, Charles Darwin, he wrote a little bit about music, not too much, but the things that he wrote about about music were very intriguing. He talked a lot about that music might be there because of sexual selection, but he also had this idea that uh, he thought that all animals, all he really said all animals that have a, a nervous system uh, should be sensitive to melody and rhythm uh, and get pleasure out of it. That was one of his, uh, I actually use it as a motto of my, uh, my recent book, uh, The Evolving Animal Orchestra. And it turns out that Darwin was not completely right, let's put it that way. <laughs> so it is not all animals, it's, it's also still lack of evidence, uh, so we can't make this claim as yet. But it is very difficult to trace these two components, for instance, uh, in the animal world. And big perception has been reasonable success. So that has now been the first documented animal uh, that has big perception, that's sensitive to the beat. Huh? If you play the music faster, this bird, this is a bird in this case, a, a cockatoo, uh, he will move faster. And when you slow down the music, he will move slower. So he does this kind of a head bobbing behavior with the music. It's a domesticated uh, cockatoo. And the name is Snowball. Uh, and he is the first. Uh, yeah, what I said, documented animal that has beat perception, confirming this idea of, 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 of Darwin that we share that with other animals. And it has been nicely shown in several related uh, sp uh, bird species as well. So that is a, an interesting phenomenon. I, in my own group, I, I try to use uh, methods that we used for measuring beat perception in newborns. So an electrophysiological method where we can see whether they are sensitive to the beat or not. And we applied the same method, uh, used the same method for uh, rhesus macaques, thinking that they are genetically very close. You would expect that they have the same solutions, the same problem. So they might also, the brains are also, uh, of, of rhesus macaques are a model of the human brain. We know a lot about our own brain and all kinds of diseases, thanks to these rhesus macaques. Uh, so the structures are very similar, motor cortex, auditory cortex, uh, parietal areas, uh, but they do not, at least we haven't found any evidence for that, they have not beat perception. So they are not as sensitive to the beat as very young newborn human babies uh, are. Um, so that is a very strange thing. So you have a genetically very close animal to you that does not have this skill and a cockatoo, which is genetically far away from this. The brain has a completely different design. Common ancestor is uh, 320 million years ago. So they are that they evolved in a very different way. So it's apparently they, yeah, one explanation is that it's convergent evolution, that they found a similar solution to the same problem, but with a completely different architecture. Uh, and, um, and Eric Jarvis and others have done a lot of research in, in making that clear that this is that this is that this is uh, the case, that you see the same yeah, um, connections between areas that have similar functions as you find in a human brain and, and one of the hypotheses is, is for, for a long time and still is I think it's updated this hypothesis that it has to do with focal learning that's the explanation or a possible explanation of why humans have beat perception of why a cockatoo has beat perception and why a rhesus macaque monkey does not have beat perception because they're not a focal learner and this is a it's an hypothesis that's now out roughly 15 years, Ani Patel had this idea. And it's still standing in the literature. He updated recently this hypothesis because there is a nice, or not, yeah, I think scientifically a nice counter example, yeah, because that's what you want to do in science. You want to have a, a hypothesis. In this case, the hypothesis that is that focal learning is a pre-condition or a prerequisite for deep perception that you can falsify. And, uh, and then what scientists love to do is to look for animals that are not a focal learner and then show that they are sensitive to the beat and then you can falsify the theory. Um, well, Peter Cook, uh, Santa Cruz, who, to try to learn, learn uh, teach, I call it a train, uh, a California sea lion uh, to do uh, beat perception. So also with metronome and with all types, types of music and then speed it up and slow it down and see if it's head bobbing behavior that he trained to do, it was a she actually. Uh, and whether, that, whether she was sensitive to it, whether she could learn this and, and she could. So this is a, in a way a falsification, if you take it literally, a falsification of the idea that a non-vocal learner 
can also do this. So again, uh, more in the direction of what Darwin thought that all animals should be sensitive to rhythm. But uh, yeah, there is a debate still whether it is really a non-focal learner or whether this is, this is a gradually evolving uh, 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 skill. Um, so there's still some debate. I think the real uh, uh, falsification would be um, if somebody has seen in his environment a dog that can really synchronize to the music and if the music becomes far, if he does it faster or slower or a horse for that matter, really indisputable non-focal learners, if they are capable of beat perception and, and synchronizing to the beat, that would be uh, the true falsification. And, but we haven't found that as yet. So this is a strong hypothesis. That this is actually still uh, around. And, um, um, and that says that it is not so much the structures that we have in our brain that allow for this particular uh, component of musicality, but it's really the connections, the strength of the connections between these areas that makes the difference. Um, so that's, I think, one component that we now have at least some uh, insight of how biologically embedded it is, which brain areas are involved, how they are coded in non-human animals, especially in birds. And, um, but yeah, there are so many animals and, and, and not all biologists are interested in studying the capacity for music. So we have to pull these people in, like, look, this is an interesting talent. It looks like it is not uniquely human. We have found it now in a, several other species. And what is the reason? Why do they have that? Um, is this indeed because they are musical in the sense that they have, they have this sensitivity that we call musicality? Mm -hmm. Or have they evolved it for other reasons? So that's, it becomes, we have more data points now. And then you can start reasoning about the evolutionary origins, uh, which is in the end what you can do then if we know how to measure these components and how to measure them in other uh, in other species so this is really a research agenda for the coming for the coming decade or lot even longer i guess yes uh, from an evolutionary perspective is there any relationship between musicality and language um, um yeah, at different positions, I would say. There are people that are thinking, claiming that it is basically the same thing. They use the same mechanisms, but just in a different mix. Uh, and they might even, some things are shared. So there's there are series that music and language share, for instance, syntactic processing. So the, the mechanism of how you make melodies or how you do sentences and then uh, do unexpected things you see in similar areas, you see, see similar activity when you have a violation of, uh, of some rule. Uh, supporting the idea that, that some aspects of music processing are shared by language and music. Um, that's one theory. <laughs> uh, um, and there is an extreme position even that say that they're completely the same thing. Uh, which is not, there's lots, not too much evidence there, there are some differences. And there is another extreme, which says that um, it, is, uh, it might actually be that uh, uh, language feeds on uh, mechanisms that have evolved for, for music. Also an idea by Darwin, eh, that there is a, this music proto-language is something very old that we might share with a lot of animals. And language just evol is something more reasoned that sort of feeds on, on those mechanisms. And music also in our recent culture is something that feeds on those mechanisms. So, and that's a, a more controversial theory, I would say, and one I find very attractive because it's sort of it focuses on the idea of what makes music now different from language, eh? that they share things. Yeah, I can imagine that. Of course, uh, there are lots of influences of language on how we perceive or recognize music. It would be strange if that's not happening. But in order to give the research on the capacity for music uh, enough credit and, and see how that is really matters is to say like what is now unique to music and can we trace those mechanisms back in for instance in the brain and can we reason about evolutionary history in certain organisms because of those structures and i like this idea that language feeds on music you see it also in ontogenic development eh? that sort of the sensitivity to melodies and intonation patterns that newborn babies have they use to learn the language. So 
what you would call like the capacity for music bootstraps or helps uh, you to learn uh, where the word boundaries are in, in the language of your of the culture that you uh, are raised in. So I like I like that thinking. Uh, just as an, it's an alternative hypothesis that might might be wrong, but it could also be. It's, I find it an, a good um, strategy. So to overstate it in the other direction. So not say like language is the main thing and music maybe feeds on it. Huh? The, the auditory cheesesteak uh, um, uh, position that, that that music is just a byproduct of uh, things that have clearly evolved in humans like speech. And I, I, I just feed on, on mechanisms there and I, it's, it's super normal stimulus in that sense. Huh? So uh, musical tone stimulates the mechanisms that are evolved for speech. And, and we like that, but it is in itself, we're not evolved to like or to enjoy music. Uh, that's the extreme one side. And the other one that I, I like very much, and that also Darwin stated huh, in his idea that all animals should be able to enjoy melody and rhythm, is that it is maybe something very old and language is specialized certain areas. Uh, but the main mechanisms of information and prosody are shared in music and language and are. Uh, this is the hypothesis. They're likely shared with lots of other animals that also are very vocal. Um, yeah, and I, I, I find an interesting hypothesis that needs more attention and needs a lot, lot of help of behavioral and neurobiologists. So I'm trying to, I'm collaborating uh, with a lot of people to, uh, to get more points on the map. <laughs> sure. But when it comes to that debate about uh, music, uh, being an adaptation or a byproduct of adaptations, uh, do we know from an evolutionary perspective if music serves any specific functions? Yeah, that's that's a yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, in, uh, there is a lot of confusion. Uh, or no, let's put it in different, uh, let's call it disagreement again. Um, there was a there is a special issue out in of um, uh, brain what is it called uh, DBS uh, brain behavioral and brain sciences two target art articles and sixty responses of all kinds of people in the fields uh, discussing about the origins of music and musicality. And if you, yeah, if you look at the, at like where all the positions are, it's sort of really spread out. So some people think that uh, music is, is really a cultural phenomenon. It's an invention of humans uh, that stayed around for a while and maybe has influences now on our, on our biology, but it was really an invention, not an adaptation. And there are others that say that's actually one camp. There's a second, but good, good arguments and good empirical support for some, some aspects. But there is another theory that says that it has really to do with social bonding, that it is a way in which we humans uh, um, uh, kept our this, the relatively large sized uh, uh, groups that humans uh, live in together. And it's a way of, of getting social cohesion and enhance empathy and make the group stronger in, uh, in that sense. So that's the social bonding uh, hypothesis with lots of nuances and, and relationships, but that's, that's also an important idea. Uh, indirect in itself, so it is music helps in uh, keeping the group together, and that is the advantage uh, uh, in an evolutionary sense. And uh, yeah, and there are many more theories. <laughs> uh, a credible signal, which is a, a signaling, is that it's also the idea, more a biologically motivated idea that that that, that uh, music might be there because it has a. Uh, uh, it's a way of uh, group uh, coalition signaling. It's a way of, of, of showing, look, we're, 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 we're together, we're strong, uh, we know what we're doing. And that gave, uh, gave you an advantage over, over other groups that didn't have this particular uh, control over, their, over these musical skills. And there are many more. There is this apparent, uh, apparent child bonding hypothesis idea. So there, there are many, many, many theories. Uh, the problem there with all these theories is, is yeah, unfortunately, this, this lack of evidence that we have uh, with music. Of, uh, that music doesn't fossilize. 
our musical brain doesn't fossilize. So it's always indirect evidence. Uh, comparative biology is one way out. Eh? <laughs> uh, you have to hear and then now, and you can then reason back about the evolutionary history if you have enough data points of other animals and skills and how they might have evolved and then see how that aligns with this with one of these theories. Uh, and another way out is genomics, which is also a very reasoned method methodology that uh, is entering our field to see like, uh, can you, yeah, if you know uh, of, of, of these components that we've discussed before, where they are coded on the, on the genome, you could also look at other animals very easily and even to to our uh, our ancestors like the, the, the genome uh, the information we have about neanderthals for instance and then reason back about the evolutionary history sort of what's the trace in the current uh, genetic coding so those are two ways out uh, of the of the absence of fossilization uh, but, but yeah, as you understand this this is all yeah all indirect unfortunately um, you find a, a, a flute, the oldest flute I think that we found on a musical artifact is uh, 40, 45,000 years old. And on an evolutionary scale, that is, that is just too, too recent to make any claims uh, and complain about. It could be an invention, it obviously is an invention, but, but it, in a way it reflects sort of the, the musical sensitivities that uh, the people in those days might have had because yeah, the holes of these flute have uneven distances interestingly so again reflecting this idea that there is there was apparently some cognitive bias active then as well uh, that has a musical origin or that you could interpret as a musical bias because uh, yeah, much to say about it. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going away from your question. But uh, 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 as said, there are many different theories and the challenge is to, to how to test them and, uh, and how to reduce them because they're probably, they can't all be true. One is probably more likely than the other one. There are probably also more aspects active at the same time, but that's, that's still the, that's the challenge as well. I think it is too early, that would be my, wrap up of evolution of music i think it is a very intriguing topic but i think we first have to know more precisely what this capacity for music is or could be how to measure that in humans and in other species and i think then we are in a position when we have to make the mechanism more clear to to to, to test these evolutionary uh, hypotheses uh, and uh, and clean it up a bit <laughs> yes uh, but when it comes to the social aspects of music, because there is a relationship between synchrony and pro-social behavior, for example, do you think that music could play a role there? Um, music could play a role in... Uh, in uh, contributing to synchrony that then <clears throat> as a relationship with pro-social behavior. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, I think, in the, I think one of the stronger empirical support for the social bonding hypothesis is, is that indeed, if people synchronize, even young children or drum together, that they become more empathic towards the other. There are several studies that have shown, shown that in different, in different ways. And that it is really an aspect of music or of rhythmic behavior and doing that together that makes you uh, uh, more pro-social. And that you can interpret as, as evidence for the idea that that is indeed one of the important functions or capacities of, of, of music making is that, yeah, that makes you empathic towards the other and that has served for its advantages. <laughs> um, so, so that's indeed, uh, yeah, one nice way to confirm uh, aspects of the social bonding theory. Um, but it is also good to keep on thinking like what are aspects that could falsify it. And that's still, uh, uh, I think it is a good scientific habit to also show what aspect of your theory is falsifiable. Um, because otherwise it's it's anything goes eh? it also has a very sympathetic 
aspect to it, that music and social bond, everybody can imagine, yeah, obviously that is true. So, so you scientifically, I don't find it very rewarding. I, I like it, to, like series to be a little bit more sharper and then maybe more reductionistic, but then at least we know what aspects are really essential and which ones are more secondary. So this is a nice example of confirmation, but um, I like the focal learning hypothesis that we talked about earlier with deep perception. I, I like that so much because it's so funerable in the sense that you, you really can falsify it. It's that clear. And I think that's really a big contribution if, if you have a theory, at least a hypothesis that is then embedded in a theory that, that, is, that is so uh, well-defined that you can falsify it. And that's not the case with the social bonding hypothesis and some of the other hypotheses. And that's, yeah, that means that we, yeah, that, that doesn't give progress to the field. <laughs> because yeah, it could be true, it could be true, mm -hmm. or not. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, but I mean, when it comes to the biological foundations of music, I guess that another source of evidence we can have for it is if we find human universals in music across different cultures. So do we have any of that? Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, also something that has been done quite, uh, for instance, in language research, had to look at all the languages over the world, uh, 6,000 plus, uh, and see are there parents similarities and does that support uh, some of the theories that there are about uh, what is essential to language and what makes it uh, uh, human. Uh, in music research, it has not been done uh, until recently, I have to say. So you would expect it seems to be like a possible thing, especially for ethnomusicologists to look at all these di different musics in the world and see what they share. Uh, but for some, uh, for, for reasons that I maybe should not go into, but musicologists or other musicologists have been really more interested in, <clears throat> in the diversity, in the differences and the uniqueness and, and, and specific music in a specific culture, but not so much interested in these, in, in these universals. Lots of debates about that as well. Uh, but since I think one of the first studies that really started to do this very, in a way, simple idea, just look at, at a large collection of music and see what they share and where they differ. Uh, first paper that came out uh, in, in using such an approach was in 2015. Uh, Pat Savage and his colleagues uh, looked at a, a, a yeah, relatively small collection, I think 300 plus different musics from all over the world from an encyclopedic uh, description and just simply uh, two I think two annotators just annotated all these musics like is there a beat yes or no uh, does it have a subdivision yes or no are there discrete pitches yes or no uh, are there all these uh, labels that are sort of this uh, described already by by musicologists like Alan Lomax and others so like just to classify very crudely binary yes or no uh, and they did that for this whole collection. And then you see that, that you see that in most of these music, indeed, all over the world, you always see this phenomenon of a regular beat being present. Also, this idea of relatively small scales, five to seven notes. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and several other aspects. Uh, so, indeed, uh, suggesting that there are universals and they, they, that they propose to call it statistical universals because it's yeah, you will never find something in all cultures there's always exceptions for social or other reasons um, so they call it statistical uh, universals and uh, and indeed pointing again at, at these same things uh, that uh, for instance this this unequal division of the octave that, that is something that is common of all the possi possible ways, hey, imagine, of all the possible ways you can sort of subdivide, if you take an octave, that's already a decision. But for some reason, you see that in most cultures that there is an octave. Uh, you see that this, you could divide this octave in, in all different ways. I mean, in, in four steps, in, in two steps, in equal steps, anything. But you see that most cultures do that in five or seven steps and then unequal sized intervals. But that hints really at, at some, some common pattern that has a likely a biological or uh, basis. So that work, and there, since then there have been 
uh, other studies done, for instance, by Sam Meyer at Harvard, uh, again, another collections, other strategies, uh, showing that there are indeed lots of patterns that you could call universals. And uh, yeah, I find this very hopeful <laughs> because it means yeah that both things are playing. So it is social and cultural aspects for the thing we call music. And there is this capacity for music that has certain characteristics. And I'm interested in those characteristics. And this shows that there might be characteristics underlying all this diversity uh, that I want to figure out how that works. Why do we have those biases? Where do they come from? Why do we have them? Um, yeah, all these questions that then come up. So the capacity for music. Yeah. So going back again to the cognitive aspects of music, is how people estimate time any way related to musicality? How people estimate time? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, let me think. Uh, so you mean... Like, because uh, there's this like idea... Like whether something is short or long or whatever, or how long have I been sitting in the waiting room? How do you, what do you mean by estimating time? Uh, yeah, because the, time? Yeah, because there's this idea that we have sort of a mental clock. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was basically asking if that is true and if it would have any relationship with musicality. Mm. Yeah, I think that um, yeah, time is very important in music. Yeah. Uh, um, so I would link it to expectation. So uh, the way we perceive rhythm, for instance. And there, of course, time is a very important one. Uh, mm -hmm. And it turns out that we have, yeah, we have mechanisms or talents in which we can, we, uh, we can uh, think of one rhythm being very exciting and another rhythm to be very dull. And, uh, and we know a lot about that, how that works, because we have apparently have certain expectations that are built up by the rhythm itself, but also often by the culture that we live in. So we have high expectations, something will happen, for instance, on the downbeat, because that's an important moment in time. And we have less expectation that something will happen somewhere else in the rhythm, uh, because it is... Uh, it is at a metrical position that is considered uh, less strong. So there's a lot of music. This is where music theory and neurobiology met a few years ago. So music theory ex has this theory about meter and which if you remove a certain note, whether it is syncopated or not, whether it gives you some tension or not, because your expectation is violated. And then we have these neurobiological methods of EEG that we also did with newborns. And then you see that if you remove a note on the downbeat where the music theory says this is a highly syncopated note if you remove that or a note somewhere else in the rhythm where it is considered not a syncopation you see that the brains of these newborns are more surprised if you do that on the downbeat uh, so they have a high expectation apparently that something will happen there and not on another position so they already have this uh, that uh, you can call it estimating time but they have uh, you have an expectation of metrical time in that sense uh, that's what this method uh, measures. And, uh, and the same with grown-ups, with adults, with musicians, non-musicians, you see that these brains distinguish between these uh, points in time, which are the same objects that are removed, but because they're in a different medical position, they are more noticed or less noticed. And that suggests that we are sort of actively or it's again evidence that we're actively listening when we're listening to rhythms. We actively are engaged and we make predictions all the time. And then sometimes they are violated and sometimes they are confirmed. But they have apparently uh, this, uh, what we you could call metrical structure in the sense that, that is, we were talking about the beat. Eh? So it's really one level of, 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 uh, of structure. And the, the, yeah lots to say about this because it could also be more highly metrical we don't know yet but this first level of the beat like where you would sort of clap your hand to or or or, or the dance to or or uh, synchronize to that sensitivity is is uh yeah we, we, we make predictions about it all the time and then your question is like do we have a mental clock again debates <laughs> uh 
uh, there's a whole line of researchers who indeed think there is something like a clock and that, that you can predict all the timing behavior and perception of, of, of time in terms of this central uh, central timing mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's quite a huge literature uh, in support of that, but there's also a huge literature in support of an alternative idea that it is really more like entrainment. So uh, that what our brains are actually doing is, is synchronizing with the signal in the way two clocks or pendulums would synchronize if they are attached to the wall. So they're, they're periodic both and they start to synchronize after a while. So us in being involved with listening to rhythms might be a process of entrainment. And you have uh, yeah, coupled oscillatory models that try to explain that. There's also a huge literature in support of that mechanism. So a very different explanation for, for a similar thing. Um, um, and yeah, in our group, we're even, uh, yeah, so yeah, there are lots of theories, but try to separate. It seems that there are multiple processes happening. Yeah, this is going to be a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, maybe just covering up that we really don't know at the moment. But we, the hint is that there, there are multiple mechanisms that we do multiple things. So one, some some expectations or some let's make it short. Some time expectations might be of a more uh, 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 a bit like uh, thing that we, you try to synchronize to the regularity in a periodic way. But there might be another way that we sort of uh, listening to the, the patterns themselves. So it's like tuck tuck tuck. Duck, duck, duck. So it's long, short, short, long. So it's more the pattern that we're recognizing and that predicts in our minds what might happen next in this particular music that we know so well. So that might be another level of, of predictions that we make. So and these two predictions together probably are closer to the whole, uh, to the full story. Mm -hmm. um... When it comes to the <clears throat> neuroscience of music, uh, are there specific areas of the brain that process music? Uh, is music localized in any way? Um, I don't. I don't think music is. Uh, there is something like a music module. No. Um, uh, even not in a way that, that you can sort of, uh, uh, that we know from language, that certain areas are, are related to specific aspects of the uh, production or the perception of linguistic structures. Uh, but we find that yeah, there have been few reviews on which areas are involved with certain aspects of music. And if you look at those maps, it's it's letterized a bit, but it's all over. <laughs> uh, so it's... Um, uh, melody recognitions of melodies are uh, frontal areas uh, the, the, uh, the, with beat perception, very deep brain areas that in, are involved, basal ganglia, cerebellum, uh, with uh, yeah, musical memory, other areas are involved. So it's 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 all over the brain. Uh, uh, yeah. So no. There is not a, a music area. Yeah, uh, is music? Although, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, although yeah. I have to, yeah, I, I always. Yeah, you also, you do have people, and that's always like uh, a good sort of starting point for for uh, for uh, uh, seeing if if there are certain are there critical structures that are involved, and people with amnesia or people that are tone deaf or beat deaf, those are always interesting to, to inform you of that. So to see like, do they have that indeed dysfunctional or, or certain brain areas that work or do not work in a way that they work in the, in the control group. So, so there are ways of figuring it out, but then often you see that the explanation of why they lack this certain skill is, is more a matter of connections that are less evolved than that there is a certain structure that's critically, uh, that is broken. Mm -hmm. uh, do we know if musicality is a case of neural reuse? Uh, I mean, are you are we reusing from a biological perspective yeah. certain neural areas to process music? Yeah, that's 
Yeah, that's, I mentioned a while ago, these three differences, but this is a fourth possibility that is, that it is like reading, yeah? this, this idea that I think uh, Stanislav Dahane very well put for reading, that is, reading is a, re is a recent invention, mm -hmm. uh, probably. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we are very good at it, and we can learn this very quickly, but it makes use of, of all kinds of things, in, for instance, in the visual system of being sensitive to, cor to sharp corners, uh, that help us to read. So that is indeed this idea of, uh, of, of, of reuse uh, of, of existing mechanisms for a new task. And you could also say music, it might be the same thing. Um, um, yeah, again, a possibility. So it's again a specific hypothesis, um, but it's good to think through. Like, what would what would, would you then predict will not happen? So, what what are, what are the constraints that such a way of thinking uh, introduces? And I haven't thought that one through too much as yet, but I find it an interesting one as well. It could also be the case. So it's good to think through. <laughs> Yes, yeah, of course. It's a nice idea. So it means, uh, you know, what it solves. But there are other theories that that borrow some aspects because there are some theories that really say, well, music is an invention. But once it was invented, it had so impact on our culture that it also started to influence our biology. So this is this gene culture uh, uh, co-evolving. Co and, and and what you're just stating, and, uh, uh, the Stanislav Dahana idea that you reuse existing, could be one mechanistic explanation of that idea. Um, so, yeah, could be the case. I, for me, it's I'm happy with any explanation in that sense because it's 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 uh, as long as, as as we sort of get a better insight in what this capacity for music then is in the end. And this is still about like where does it come from, <laughs> the evolution, which for me is the the final answer, final topic that we should, could study. Uh, but this is uh, that's, these are nice thought experiments. Mm -hmm. But since you mentioned evolution, let me just ask you perhaps two or three more questions about the biological and evolutionary foundations of music and musicality. So. Do we have any evidence that musicality could have been sexually selected? Yeah, that, 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 that was actually that was the, 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 the idea of Darwin. He said that music is, is, is one, of, one of the most mysterious things that we have as humans. Uh, it doesn't still our hunger. We don't live a day longer, but still we, we, it has an impact, and he thought that was related to sexual selection. Uh, because there must be a reason why all these animals invest so much energy in creating these organs and making these sounds that that, uh, that uh, it must have had an advantage. So, um, uh, because the question is, uh, is like sexual selection, what is uh, they're in support of it. And if I do the quick answer, I think there is little support. In fact, although the idea is very attractive, there is little support for the idea of music being a result of sexual selection in humans. Uh, there have been some studies done with twins uh, and testing their musical uh, capacities and also their whole uh, history of, of, of uh, sexual history and, and offspring history. And you see that there is a overall uh, a negative correlation. So mm. people that are musically more uh, attentive or more productive in that sense are not uh, preferred in terms of sexual selection. Mm. Uh, 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 Argument. So that's negative evidence, and there is more negative evidence of uh, in, in perceptual studies, like uh, presenting uh, listeners uh, melodies of certain complexities, uh, especially female listeners, in the idea that sort of replicating the, the experiments that have been done with birds. And clearly, in birds, you see that if you have a melody that's more complex, certain canaries really 
find that female canary tribe that's very attractive the more common, so they're, they're really sensitive to these signals and you do not see that in, the, in humans at all and again often a negative correlation so although this idea that yeah anecdotally yeah, that you see in pop music that that that, that, that uh, young uh, adolescents really get sort of overwhelmed by this pop star that it's clearly there are lots of sexual signals there and that is it's a way to impress uh, uh, females for male guitarists uh, but i think that is anecdotal uh, it sounds like a good idea but the empirical evidence is is meager to say at the least so not uh yeah uh well, that was i think not a good idea from Darwin. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, in that case of popular musicians, for example, I guess that there are some confounding factors there because it could be just a case of their of them having social status or social standing or more access to more resources or something like that. It doesn't have to be related to their musical skills, right? True, true. Yeah, yeah, and it is. Um... But again, here it, it would be good to think of what, what would I mean. There's evidence against the idea, but what would be a falsifiable aspect of, of sexual selection as the origins of music? And once you have that, you can really we can really get rid of that theory once and for all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I haven't be able to think of a good way of falsifying it. Yes, but, uh, I'm sure one of the viewers do have that idea, and then please do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, of course, go ahead. Uh, okay, so just two more questions then. Uh, the sounds that certain animals produce, like for example, bird songs, uh, are is that classified as music? Um, yeah, yes and no. Um, yes, yeah, in our ears, a bird, a nightingale that sings this beautiful, or these, uh, what are they called, the musician's wren. Uh, South American bird, they, it's, it is really, it's almost Mozart, it's beautiful, it's music in our ears. Yeah. Uh, so that's the yes. Uh, and the no or the, or the maybe is like, like the, again, the question is not so much, is it music, yes or no? Yeah, in our ears it is music because we, are, we project our musical expectations on these sounds. We listen to the pitches and the rhythms and therefore it is music in our ears. But the question should be the other way around. Is it music in the ears of the bird? Mm -hmm. uh, so what, uh, what capacities does this bird have or use in order to get this information out of that signal? And is that relatable to our to, to musical experience that we humans have? Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a more difficult question, but, but, but more to the point for our field. Because yes, uh, whale song, beautiful music, <laughs> uh, orcas, lots of different dialects with small melodies. Yeah, music in our ears, of course. But that's uh, anything is music in our ears because we have this capacity for music, apparently. Yes. Um, so for our field, the question should be reversed. Um, so, so to see like, what is the mechanisms that they use and make? And, yeah, and do they get, as Darwin said, pleasure out of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, do we know if any other species shows interest in music? And in this case, I'm talking about human, human produced music. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the funny thing is that most of this, the early research in, in musicality is really of, of a the naivety that you it's all that's yeah, really it looks very I mean, one of the first studies was with, uh, I think, with uh, a goldfish and play Stravinsky and Bach to goldfish and then see what they like, whether they have a musical preference. For some strange reasoning, why would a goldfish be interested in musical culture and why would he have a preference for one music over another one? But that, those experiments were done in the beginning with goldfish and with koi, uh, carpers and other type of fish, with frets, with doves. So, uh, yeah, the naivete there is, is probably that, that these animals, they probably, 
they, they probably focus on one little detail and that's how they distinguish the VHC from Bach and that's how they might be able to generalize it, like how, how doves in, uh, can solve the task of, uh, of pigeons, I should say, <laughs> solve the task of recognizing a Van Gogh versus a, uh, what is it, uh, a Mondrian or another a painter uh, by just focusing on a small detail and that's the big difference between these two and that's how they solve these tasks and then yeah we humans tend to say well look they can recognize uh, impressionists versus uh, modernists um, so and there are other experiments of another nature more recent uh, for instance a study by Frans de Waal who uh, with his students played different types of human musics in chimpanzee compound in the chimpanzee compound so in different corners and then they measured the time where they were sitting in near some music or some other music as, as a way of uh, sort of a spatial paradigm in a way of sort of uh, measuring musical preference it seems that they liked i think it was indian music that they liked better than japanese music so but again, with this strange assumption that they, yeah, we don't know what these chimpanzees are listening to or listening for in these yeah. music. Uh, so, uh, so, so I don't find that the ideal stimulus. <laughs> again, with Ronan and with Snowball, these are really domesticated animals, and it is strange to see like how and yeah, why would the Californian sea lion? What what would be uh, uh, the meaning of? I think it was uh, Earth Within Fire that I played with them. <laughs> uh, Poopy Wonderland. So that's that's really not ecologically valid. So um, so I think all these studies of of interacting with humans and with human music. There are some some researchers working on that. I think is. Uh, uh, I don't think it is an informative strategy. I think we should stay closer to yeah the conspecific sounds of these animals and then. Uh, reason about what, what could be musical aspects in that particular environment for these animals. Um, yeah. Okay, so Dr. Honig, uh, before we go, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Um, yeah, I think it's actually behind me, the Music Cognition Group, MCG dot uva dot nl is, is our main website and uh, and if you google you will find enough things related to that um and i think the 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 origins of musicality this 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 volume that came out at mit press with uh, 23 of my colleagues writing about musicality and what we should do in the coming 10 years i think could also be hopefully inspiring for people to read uh, and help us <laughs> there's work to do <laughs> yes okay so uh, thank you very much for taking the time to come on the show and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you same for me thanks very much Ricardo hi guys thank you for watching this interview until the end if you liked it please share it leave a like and hit the subscription button please also consider supporting the show on patreon or paypal all of the links are in the description of the interview the show is brought to you by nlights learning and development done differently check their website at nlights.com i would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and paypal supporters karen litzke and blanchett perugo larsen lau guerrero francis ford and frederick sunda ricardo vladimir craig healy adam castle olaf alex jonathan Wiesel, jacob Klinkwi, matthew whittingbird arno wolf tim hollacy enrique lenia john connors paulina baron philip force connelly jerry Mueller, herbert gintis bo weingard rebecca newberger goldstein dan demetri robert windegger rui nasio arthur co zoop marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Bernardo Seixas, Paulo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Robert Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslin Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, JW, João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londoño Correa, 
Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Pelizzo, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott and Zachary Fish. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardis France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.